this particular discipline may be a little bit different than what you're normally accustomed to. By discussing this particular generally underutilized niche, um, like I said, we're going to be taking a little bit of a different slant today. Um, and I just wanted to say that oftentimes when I talk to people about going out in the field with a butterfly net, and granted that takes a little practice swinging a net for some of you possibly interested in this, and you don't have that experience, it takes a little getting used to. But some people have pushed back on the idea of collecting gravid females because um, they feel like the females may be unmated and be virgin and have to collect the female. Then they have to go to the trouble of collecting the male, bringing them back, pairing them up, and all that. Um, I can assure you that more often than not, females seen in the wild are mated. Trust me. Male butterfly instincts are very aggressive in courting females soon after your closure. In fact, uh, in the photograph in this slide on the left, you see two zebra longwing males literally parked. <laughs> on a chrysalis of a female pupa, waiting for her to emerge so they can couple with her. I mean, they're going to mate with her even before she has time to dry her wings. Well, that's how aggressive some species are. So um, I know that sounds a little ridiculous, but in nature, males are incredibly prolific at doing what they're instinctively driven to do. I wanted to share some photos of, uh, some really cool photos from Edward Perry IV, who lives in Florida, of some males courting females. In this slide, we have Palamedes swallowtails. Again, the same pair of Palamedes swallowtails with the male and female juxtaposed. Females on top, males on the bottom. On the left photo, on the photo on the right, we have got a couple of whirlabout skippers also from Florida with the female on the left and the male on the right. Okay, today's presentation will be broken down into four parts. And to be honest with you, parts one and two will serve more or less as a preamble where we are setting the stage for the mechanics of this presentation, which are basically parts three and parts four. So part one is uh, leverage butterfly gardening and understand its limitations. And the reason why I'm gonna be talking about the productivity or lack thereof of butterfly gardening is that, you know, I can't speak to Eurasia or Africa or South America, but I do have some experience with breeding butterflies in North America. And not everything is equal in North America. So we'll be talking about butterfly gardening, uh, its benefits and limitations in part one. Part two will, will be build a basic species level butterfly checklist, filter down to county level in the USA or province level in Canada using Bimona. Bimona is short for the butterflies and moths of North America. It's a website which uh, talks about many of the species in that region. Three, dedicate, and this one's the kicker, sufficient time in nature to learn how to separate male versus female butterflies, both by behavior as well as wing markings. Um, and four, reviewing some basic techniques to set up females from a variety of species groups to lay eggs, and those species groups will be by family as well as size. Okay, let's jump into part one, leverage butterfly gardening and understand its limitations. We've all heard the political, not political theme, but we've all heard the meme, if you grow it, they will come. Butterfly gardening has grown to be very popular. However, what many may not understand is when, where, and why butterfly gardening is productive, and when, where, and why it is not productive. And that's kind of what I want to talk about a little bit. So the whole point, as we know, of butterfly gardening is to attract what's local, which drives the next natural question. So what's local? What butterfly species fly in my area? And later on, we're going to be building a butterfly checklist so that we have a real good feel for that on a local level. But butterfly gardens do not mystically and magically draw in butterflies that are breeding, say, in habitat specific locations that 50 miles away. Um, they are, the whole intent of a and design of a butterfly garden is to attract what's locally flying or what migrating species might be coming to your area. The driving point that I want to make here is that there is a great division in North America that I think many butterfly garden book authors overlook. And that division basically is none other than the continental divide. I'm gonna spend I'm gonna be spending a little bit of time on this slide because I think it's important when examining butterflies on a continental level. From Canada south to Mexico, the continental divide creates a mountainous barrier between two vastly, greatly different physiogeographic regions of North America, basically east versus west. 
As such, there are significant differences between butterfly diversity and butterfly availability on either side, which is kind of ironic considering we know that monarchs are genetically identical on both sides of the divide. Now, when I reference the continental divide, it's not like I'm saying the differences are night and day right on the divide itself. Like here's a picture of me at Independence Pass in Colorado. If I were to walk, say, five feet away from this sign, you know, the humidity is not going to go from, say, 12% to 80% within a mile or two. Uh, it's more of a subtle transition on both sides of the Continental Divide. I have driven I-70 from Utah uh, into the front range of Colorado and into the prairies of eastern Colorado, western Kansas, into the more forested regions of eastern Kansas and eastern Nebraska, where this transition from west to east is more subtle. And I'll talk about what aspect of that tra transition I'm talking about. So the bottom line is this. And many of you already know this, but I just want to reinforce this if we're going to talk about attracting butterflies to your local area. The reality is butterflies east of the Continental Divide tend to be incredibly more common, visible, and available, especially to those in the suburbs who create butterfly gardens in the Midwest and Eastern North America than those west of the Continental Divide. This advantage is at the very heart of the popularity of butterfly gardening. Again, I want to be clear that the opposite is true west of the Continental Divide, where attracting a diversity of butterflies to a garden is, by definition, problematic. So the natural question to what I'm driving here is why? Why is there this disparity between suburban butterfly visibility east versus west in North America, as <clears throat> split by the Continental Divide? The answer is simple, water. For those of you east of the Continental Divide, I'm going to be focusing my comments to you here for a little bit. But for those of you west, hang tight. <clears throat> I'll get back with you here in a minute and discuss some options. The Midwestern and Eastern US benefit from the existence of the Gulf of Mexico and the fact that the Atlantic Ocean is much warmer. Some sources say it's much as 16 degrees warmer than the Pacific Ocean at <clears throat> excuse me, the same latitude. This is true because much of the Atlantic Ocean seaboard is fed water um, from the Caribbean, so it's warmer. Whereas in the Pacific Ocean, the water streams or the water flows, if you will, in the ocean comes from near Alaska and it's much colder. This drives a well-known phenomenon known as humidity. Now we know people hate humidity. I, I'm from the West, I'm used to the dry weather, and whenever I feel humidity, I actually like it. But a lot of people don't like humidity, but butterflies do. Again, it goes back to water. Humidity drives an abundance of vegetation, which supports a boatload of butterflies, butterflies that can easily be attracted to a garden if the right host and nectar sources are planted. So we butterfly enthusiasts from the West can only be jealous of the benefits of the green forests and wonderful gardens and butterfly diversity that the uh, Midwest and Eastern North America benefits. Here's just a sampling of butterflies that many butterfly gardeners uh, can attract swallowtails and sulfurs, monarchs, viceroys, red spotted purples, and all sorts of butterflies that can be attracted to a garden. In fact, if you haven't purchased uh, Brenda's book, Raising Butterflies in the Garden, I would uh, recommend it. She talks about a lot of different host plants and nectar sources that you can grow in your garden if you don't already have a really nice garden. Many of you already do. <coughs> Excuse me, many of you already do. Well, this might be necessary, but Brenda does a really, got a, a really good job in uh, pulling this together. So this leads up to a question. So why would any of you from the Midwest or East uh, want to venture outside your property, um, your butterfly garden, if you can attract so many showy species locally? And the answer, the short answer is simple. You may not need to, you may not want to. Think of your butterfly garden as the plan A to bring some new species uh, to your property and then venturing outside of your garden into natural butterfly habitat as a plan B. But the thought is this, if you do see species nectaring in your garden, if you see females, why not net them to set them up to lay eggs if they're from a new species that you might want to raise if you're not already raising them? Uh, and this kind of leads to the question, well, how can I tell the difference between a male and a female of a given species nectaring in my garden? And we're going to talk about that in part three. It's just I wanted to introduce the thought that you could uh, 
you may not have to you may not have to venture far to raise some new species. So I realized going to the west of the continental divide, I realized that percentage-wise, only a handful of you live in Western North America. But I would like to discuss some viable options for you to compensate the lack of garden butterfly diversity that can be attracted to the suburbs. Before I do that, there are some exceptions in the Western US, and again, it goes back to water. Um, I, I don't think we have any IBBA members currently, I could be wrong, from Southeast Arizona. In Southeast Arizona, if you were to go to Tucson, say in June, there's not a lot of butterfly diversity there, but there are some species that are awakened and triggered to fly um, soon after the heavy monsoons that hit. Uh, Pinal, Pima, Maricopa County, Arizona, um, and that fly following the monsoons. So there's a lot of butterfly enthusiasts and butterfly lovers in say Tucson, Arizona, where there are very few in Las Vegas, Nevada, because the monsoons don't benefit Las Vegas nor its uh, vegetation as it does in Southeast Arizona. So um, there's also a lot of Mexican species that will blow up following the monsoon season and migrate into Southeast Arizona. Also, uh, in this picture, I've got some green on the California coast, Oregon coast. There is some slight raise in humidity along the California coastal areas where you can att actually attract monarchs, gulf frets, and anti swallowtails to gardens. But once you go inland, where it becomes more arid, then our problem of Western North America tends to persist. Again, it's all about water. So the truth of the matter is in order to understand how to raise Western species, if you live out West, is to understand where those butterflies can be found. And that can be broken down into five subcategories. Um, their habitat includes mountain canyons, mountain hilltops, valley rivers, wetlands, and the fifth, which is not natural, agricultural farms, which are you know, fed with irrigation water. That irrigation water still uh, can grow alfalfa and other weeds that uh, attract several different species of butterflies. So the problem with this is more often than not, these natural western butterfly habitats are nowhere near your garden. They're nowhere, if you live in a city, if you live in a suburb, uh, if the butterflies are breeding in canyons on mountain hilltops, you may be dozens of miles away from where they're actually breeding, which is our problem here in Salt Lake City. We have some people who have heard about the successful butterfly gardens of the Midwest and back east and have read those books and have bought into that rhetoric and are frustrated, quite frankly, at the lack of butterfly diversity, even though when they grow the correct nectar sources and host plants, in my own garden, in my own yard, I have attracted a, occasionally monarchs, gray hair streaks, west coast ladies, painted ladies, clouded sulfurs, you know, the butterflies that you see in this slide, but not consistently. And I do have a lot of nectar sources and host plants because I use them for raising. As a matter of fact, the most consistent butterfly that is adapted to suburbia in the Western US is the cabbage white. Because cabbage, cabbage whites love suburban weeds. Uh, they use mustards like white top, dyer's road, and other weedy mustards as host plants, and use dandelions, butterfly bush, and other plants as a nectar source. All of this is ironic because there is an amazing diversity, even I think more so if you go to Butterflies of America and look at all the species and subspecies west of the continental divide because of all the mountain ranges and speciation in terms of number of taxa. There's actually more west of the divide than east. They're just far, far more invisible. Uh, this slide itself just shows butterflies that I have studied in Utah. These are, all, these are Utah specific. And I've had to learn the life histories of those butterflies and how to raise them by traveling uh, into their habitat. Uh, this is one reason why I've created on Facebook a, a field trip group called Utah Butterfly Field Trips. Um, I kind of feel bad about the issues of butterfly gardening in the West, especially in Utah. So I've created this uh, field trip group where I've taken people to the mountain hilltops of the Wasatch or, or canyons, basically all over the state to find natural areas where you can find a pretty good diversity of butterflies. Okay, let's jump to part two. Build a basic butterfly checklist for your county or province using Bomona. As I say, Bomona, is butterfliesandmoths.org. It stands for Butterflies and Moths of North America. So we're gonna show you if, if, if the goal is to maybe add a few species to your repertoire of what you're raising, possibly species that fly near you, but uh, maybe you haven't attracted it to your garden. 
uh, we're going to show you how to build a checklist. <clears throat> so once you go to that website, this represents the landing page of butterfliesandmoths.org. From there, you want to go to the main uh, toolbar up above and to the right and look for species profiles and then click on it. Once you click on species profile, click on regional checklists. From there, you'll be taken to a page that lists all of the butterflies and moths recorded in North America, all of North America. And just as a heads up, other countries that can be queried from Bimona outside of US, Canada, and Mexico are Barbados, Belize, Bermuda, Bonaire, Cayman Islands, Costa Rica, Cuba, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Guatemala, Haiti, Honduras, Jamaica, Mexico, Nicaragua, Panama, Puerto Rico, St. Kitts, and the Bahamas. So it does cover quite a bit of region, not only in North America, but in the Caribbean as well. So from here, if we want to generate a uh, checklist, we go to species type on the left and click on it, where a drop down menu appears, which is butterfly and moth, and you want to click on butterfly. Then we want to go to region. If you click on any, you'll get a list of all the countries. So let's say uh, we want to look for Luzerne County, Pennsylvania in the United States. So we select the United States first, and then as our state, we select Pennsylvania, and lastly, Luzerne County. And then we hit apply. I just gave away my punchline. <laughs> oh, well, I was going to ask you guys, uh, who, who, what uh, famous uh, IBBA person uh, lives in Lucerne County, Pennsylvania, and the answer is none other than Rick Mykula. I had to email Rick to make sure he's still in Lucerne County and he lives in Pennsylvania. So this is our checklist of Rick's butterflies that we see here. And what we have here are we have 36 documented skippers, six swallowtails, five pyrids, and pyrids is a fancy word for whites, sulfurs, and orange tips. Um, 23 gossamer wing butterflies, those are the smaller diminutive butterflies that are coppers, blues, and hair streaks, and 33 brushfoots. And brushfoots, um, most of you know what brushfoot butterflies, it's a large family, including the monarchs, the viceroys, the red spotted purples, the emperors, the uh, hackberry butterflies, checker spots, crescents, and so on. So we have this big, huge list generated just from Rick's County. Um, what's also nice uh, is if you look uh, on this list, there is a PDF icon down on the bottom there. I don't know if you could see my, I thought I had put an arrow on that, but you can convert this list into a PDF uh, file. Uh, that's generated. Okay, so going back to this slide, let's say you're taking a look at all of the butterflies that fly in your county and you know, is it practical for you to want to raise all of them? Of course not. Should you want to learn to raise 10% of the butterflies that fly in your county? Uh, not likely, but maybe there's two or three that pique your interest. For example, I've got circled here the clouded sulfur and the orange sulfur. Um, let's take a look at those. So if you click on those from Bimona's webpage, you get a nice little write-up. <clears throat> a nice little write-up. Um, excuse my frog in my throat. Um, I was hoping I'd get to an hour without having to take a uh, sip of water. But um, the landing page, excuse me for a second. Maybe that'll help. The landing page for the uh, orange sulfur basically shows basic information on the distribution, life history, number of flights per year, host plants and nectar sources, habitat for this butterfly. So if this is a butterfly that flies in your county and here's the basic particulars of where you might want to go look for it, that might be helpful. Here's the same page for the clouded sulfur. Uh, like the orange sulfur, it flies on a continental level. And I think a lot of breeders and hobbyists who want to display or consider raising butterflies for releases should consider these two species because they fly on a continental level. Uh, I'd have to double check to see if they're on the USDA list. I believe they are. We'd have to double check that. But at least you could release them locally if it's not. And they're not very difficult to raise. I'm raising both, I'm raising both of them 
right now. <clears throat> okay, and as I said before, you can um, convert this checklist to PDF where you get a nice eight and a half by 11. This slide represents three pages uh, with the branding of the Moan up on top and it shows all the butterflies that you can print out. It's a nice uh, printable. Okay, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but wanted to introduce another website briefly within the next two minutes called Butterflies of America, uh, www.butterfliesofamerica.com. What Bemona doesn't provide, it provides a lot of useful information, including distribution maps, is it doesn't dive into what we call subspecies. Now for breeder butterflies, most breeder butterflies don't have regional segregates as subspecies, but some do. And the pipevine swallowtail, the page that you see here, does have subspecies, but Bemona doesn't get into that. As a matter of fact, if you look at the distribution map, you see that the butterfly is uh, available in most of the Midwest and Eastern North America, barely getting into Canada. But as you go from East to West and West Texas and in New Mexico, it becomes much more scarce into Southern Arizona, uh, barely touching Southern Nevada, Southern Utah, but it does get into California. So let's focus on California a little bit. This is the distribution maps. Again, we're on the Bemona site of the pipeline swallowtail. But what the Bemona site doesn't teach you is that all of those records north of Bakersfield and Santa Barbara in California going into Fresno up to the Oregon border, that those are not uh, the typical pipevine swallowtails that everyone is pretty familiar with. Those are the California pipevine swallowtails. It's another subspecies. So the regular pipevine swallowtail, the scientific name is Batis philanor, philanor. The genus, species and subspecies are the same because it's the first described subspecies. We call that nominate or nominotypical. But a new subspecies has been described um, quite a long time ago called Batis philanor hirsuta and it uses a specific Aristolochia californica host. And the reason why this is relevant is you don't wanna be shipping regular pipevine swallowtails into central or northern California where another subspecies flies. So that's just the benefit of the Butterflies of America website to, to access that. Let's say you, wanted, you knew that there was two subspecies. Uh, the way I do that is I simply put the genus and species, in this case, Batis, Philanor, and then the word thumbnails and then look at the hits on the Butterflies of America site and I click on it and I get a write-up, not only of nominal typical Philanor or the regular pipevine swallowtail, but also of the California pipevine swallowtails as shown on the left as circled in red. So that's just um, some basic FYI that that information on subspecies of all subspecies of North America from Panama to Alaska is available through butterfliesofamerica.com and enough on that. Okay, up until this point, we have generated a local butterfly checklist. We've identified and researched what species we may wanna take a look at uh, raising from our local area. What's next? The next step is to take it to nature. You'll need a reliable butterfly net to do this. And for some of you that might feel a little awkward of the idea of swinging a butterfly net. And all I can say is practice, practice, practice. It can be a little awkward. Practice on cabbage whites, practice on more common butterflies, netting and releasing and so forth. But if you're gonna collect a female, obviously you need a reliable net. And I recommend bioquip.com that has a large selection of student nets, insect nets, uh, collapsible nets, all sorts of butterfly nets are available through bioquip. So if you want to explore outside of your property within near where you live, I would say start somewhere, go anywhere. Whether it be a local bike trail, like you see on the left here in the woods next to a small creek in Northern Virginia, or a larger river strewn with willows, docks, and grasses on the Nevada-Idaho border. Again, it all depends on where you live. Or a nearby vacant lot with weeds such as clovers, senna grasses, plantain, fennel, docks that support butterflies such as orange sulfurs, uh, cloudless sulfurs, buckeyes, eastern black swallowtails, viceroys, and so forth. Or if you live in South Florida, perhaps a hardwood hammock in Miami-Dade County. Note the uh, polydamus swallowtail you see flying in the left. Um, don't tell Connie, I stole that from her backyard. So um, we'll try to keep that hush hush. 
even man-made habitats like alfalfa fields in the West uh, attract not only uh, alfalfa feeding butterflies such as um, orange sulfurs, clouded sulfurs, marine blues, melissa blues, but also attract other butterflies that use weeds growing with or adjacent to alfalfa like plantain, black mustards, and grasses that attract buckeyes, checkered whites, common wood nymphs, not to mention a few grass feeding skippers. If you live in Southern California, you may want to venture out to the San Gabriel Mountains and check out Azusa Canyon. Or if you live in Utah, Rock Canyon of Provo, Utah. Just make sure that if you see some cougar cubs in Rock Canyon, steer clear. I don't care if they're cute. You don't want anything to do with cougar clubs. I mean, if you want to see the cougars in Provo, you can always go to LaBelle Edwards Stadium. Go Cougs. Okay. Or you could check out Powerline right of ways in Glen Burnie, Maryland in search of pearl crescents, eastern tail blues, red spotted purples, cloudless sulfurs, eastern black swallowtails, etc. Or check out a local city park. You could check out the tops of the Wasatch Mountains where there's a lot of butterflies because there's a lot of vegetation up there because you have 10 feet of snow. All the way down to a handful of species you can find in the Colorado Plateau or even the Mojave Desert. Again, regardless of where you live, to find a diversity of butterflies, you need a diversity of vegetation, which only occurs uh, through areas of humidity, rain, or man-made irrigation. So if you're a homebody who only wants to explore butterflies on your property, I might uh, invite you to venture out a little bit and see what you can learn. Again, water leads to a diversity of vegetation, which leads to diversity of butterflies on both sides of the continental divide. It's just a little harder to find in the West. Okay, part three, dedicate time in the field to distinguish male from female butterflies. This is important. I know we're sending you out there to look for female butterflies, but the road to learning female butterfly behavior, unfortunately comes through male butterfly behavior. And you'll see why here in a minute as I share some thoughts. And that is this, males are simply far more visible than females. I don't know how to sugarcoat this. If we want to find females, we first need to familiarize ourselves with males and learn to ignore them or at least appreciate what they do in search of females. Uh, in terms of what's out there in nature, it is a 50-50 split usually. But males are so aggressive in doing the male thing in search of females that they are very overt. They are very obvious. And so we, the better we can learn what males do, the more different females will look like in terms of their behavior. And that's what we're talking about in this section. Um, and there's basically two overarching clues to separate males from females in the field. The most obvious one as gained to experience is behavior. And the second minor one that we can also leverage is wing markings. But without a butterfly net, it's kind of hard to see the wing markings unless they're nectaring, of course. So in nature, like I say, males uh, do not outnumber females 10 to one, but based upon visibility, it sure seems that way. And it's interesting, when people see butterflies on wing, what most don't realize is the vast majority of what they are seeing is males actively seeking females. If you see a butterfly, more likely than not, that's not, that's what you're seeing. How they do this is broken down into species groups. Males tend to be quite obvious and visible in search of females, a point that I've already made. And uh, so the male mating behavior in search of females include one, patrolling. They patrol their habitat back and forth. Two, perching. They like to perch on rocks, the ground, or higher up in a tree, waiting to dart and investigate females or anything that remotely looks like a female. Three, hilltopping. Uh, some male species will go, you know, if they're in the west, they'll go right to the tops of the mountains to look for females. And females will go there as well to mate once. Four, tackling. Do we know any species that tackle? I can think of a monarch. Uh, monarchs aren't exactly subtle. Monarch males are not very subtle with females and how they court as they have been known to tackle. And they'll even tackle other males to intimidate them to get them out of their territory. And four, mud puddling. And more, mud puddling is more of an indirect male behavior. We'll talk about that here in a bit. We'll talk about that now. Um, here's an example of some Western tiger swallowtails, pale swallowtails, two-tailed swallowtails puddling on the left and California dog faces puddling on the right. Um, males may be aggressive in search of females, but they're also kind of sexist because males will engage in puddling parties far more than females. 
females generally all these butterflies in both these pictures are males and they are gaining the nutrients the electrolytes the minerals they need to mate males generally emerge before females and they need to get their act together um, for those of you who breed in your uh, flight houses, you know that when the male emerges, the female emerges, the female emerges ready to mate, and the male is not ready to mate immediately. He needs some time to fly. He needs some time to get some nutrients. He just needs time to gird up his loins, as it were. Going back to the first four behaviors, patrolling, perching, hilltopping, tackling, the common denominator in all these strategic male behavior is chasing. Male butterflies actively chase. Not to digress too much, but you know, it's interesting, speaking of male perching behavior, a few years back, I was leading a Utah butterfly field trip for about 10 participants hiking a trail adjacent uh, to a canyon called South Willow Canyon in Northern Utah, where I pointed out it perched Wiedemeyer's Admiral male. He was up in a tree above a river. And I wanted to use that moment in time to teach male butterfly behavior. Uh, I actually tried and attempted a joke. I picked up a rock and then I asked my participants, do you know what the difference is between a female Wiedemeyer's Admiral and this rock? Most people gave me this blank stare like going, uh, no. So I threw the rock up in the air and the male Wiedemeyer's Admiral jumped from his perch and followed the rock almost down to the river before ignoring it. And then I said, Apparently, he doesn't know the difference either. Okay. So when you're out in the field, I don't know if that was funny or not, but that was my attempt at humor. When you're out in the field um, and you see male, you see butterflies chasing each other, oftentimes it's males chasing males. So I don't know if this graphic helps, but sometimes you'll see two, three, four males just chasing each other, and those are all males. But when you see a butterfly chasing another butterfly and the second butterfly, the one being chased is a little bigger and it lands and it flutters its wings and it's saying, leave me alone, I don't wanna mate with you, that's the female. As a matter of fact, when you're out in the field looking for gravid females to collect and set up to lay eggs, you could let some of the males of that species do the work for you by following them, watch what they do. They are out there looking for females too. And when they find one, you can say, thank you very much and net her. <laughs> Okay, so let's recap male versus female flight behaviors, or at least review male flight behaviors before we introduce females. The males, like I say, they patrol, they perch, they hilltop, they tackle. Um, they're very overt, very obvious. Females, on the other hand, are different. And like I say, the more you're familiar with male flight behavior, the easier it is to note females. Females tend to be larger. They tend to fly slower. They tend to fly more deliberately in search of their host plants. They like to lay low. Um, they don't want males to notice them. Once they're mated, and oftentimes they mate quickly, they don't want to be noticed by males, so they try to you know, do a low profile. Virgin females know how to find patrolling males uh, once to mate, but once they do that, they want nothing to do with them. So once mated, females are much less visible and fly much less conspicuously. Let's talk about um, differentiating males from females. Now that we've talked about the behavior, let's talk about wing patterns. Here's a potpourri of some species that are, there are some differences between males and females. Some are more obvious and some are more subtle. For North American swallowtails, a good baseline to discuss sexual dimorphism and sexual dimorphism meaning males and females look different. Uh, dimorphism is two forms sexual by gender, male versus female. Um, we talked about pipe vine swallowtails before. Let's talk about that as it's a good baseline because other swallowtails will mimic the pipe vine swallowtail because it is inedible to birds. So in this picture here, we've got a male and a female uh, Eastern black swallowtail where the female Eastern black swallowtail actually mimics the male pipe vine swallowtail as the male pipe vine swallowtail uh, is inedible to birds. It's, it is Eastern black swallowtail is to pipe vine what a viceroy is to a monarch. Other swallowtails that get in on the mimicry um, and also has sexual uh, male versus female differences is the Eastern tiger swallowtail. On the left, you see the dark form, which mimics the pipe vine swallowtail and the spice bush, which superficially, they don't have to look perfectly like a viceroy. You look closely at a viceroy and we can see it's not a monarch. 
but birds have a harder time separating them, and hence the viceroy is protected. So is the spice bush, swallowtail, both gender are protected uh, somewhat because of the mimicry with, um, in comparison to the pipe flying swallowtail. So how you can use that is, since males look different than females, um, you can recognize females easier, especially with the eastern tiger more so than the spice bush. Now out west, since uh, the swallowtails haven't adapted, well, some of them have, but these two, the western tiger on the left and the pale on the right, uh, do not have a form that mimics the pipeline swallowtail, it being much more scarce in the west. And so to separate them out, go back to behavior. The females are bigger, they're slower, they fly in association with the host plant. Males of both these species, uh, you've got western tiger on the left and pale on the right, males tend to patrol. It's interesting, pale swallowtails in California love the hilltop, like in the Laguna Mountains of San Diego County, whereas I noticed them in Utah, they patrol. They don't uh, hilltop quite as much, which is kind of interesting. So let's talk about the differences in gender with the pyrids, which is the whites, orange tips, and sulfurs. The males are different than the females. They tend to have um, their black border tends to be a solid marking on the males, especially on the southwestern orange tip on the left, as you can see. In the middle, the checkered white, it's not as solid, but the checkered effect is less. And then if you go to the right, the clouded sulfur has a solid black border. Whereas if you contrast that to the females, off to the left, the southwestern orange tip, it's a checkered black and white look, as you can see. And then you see that also in the checkered white itself. Um, much more of the checkered markings on the wings. And then going to the clouded sulfur, which represents a lot of sulfurs. Um, I'm talking about temperate North American sulfurs of the genus Coleus, not, not the cloudless sulfur, the orange barred sulfurs. They have some sexual differences as well, but I'm talking about some of the smaller sulfurs that uh, don't, uh, that aren't as common in uh, South Florida. So anyway, there is some differences with the pyrids with that checkered effect. Let's jump to some of the brushfoots, the viceroy. Uh, if you take a look at the differences between males and females, the, the length of the bodies are about the same and the length of the antenna are the same, but the wings on the females tend to be wider and a little bit taller as compared to male. Now, I don't know if you know that the red spot of purple, in contrast, um, both these species are, come from the same genus, Limonitis, and are very closely related. As a matter of fact, they'll interbreed with each other. But it's the same story with red spotted purples. So the females are a little larger, a little wider. Another member of that genus from California and Idaho, Oregon, Washington, is the Lorquins Admiral. And the females of that tend to be wider and a little taller. Um, I put it to you another way. I did some playing with uh, Photoshop and I superimpose the males on top of the females for these three limonitis species, Viceroy, RSP, Lorquins, Admiral. Um, and as you can see, the females, although the abdomen, or excuse me, the bodies are about the same length and as are the antennae, the females are wider, as you can see on all three species. So there's this commonality in, a diff in addition to behavioral differences in wing shape differences. I put it to you another way. Um, I actually, uh, put males and female bodies together on Photoshop. These are not natural, what they call bilateral gynandromorphs. These are fake bilateral gynandromorphs, male on one side, female on the other. But by Photoshopping them like this, it makes those differences even more obvious. And it's not restricted to the admirals and viceroys when we're talking about brushfoot butterflies. The family name is Nymphality. Um, if you go to the checker spots, the smaller checker spots and crescent spots, same story, you've got wider females, larger females on the right than you have on the left. Um, those are checker spots above and crescents below. Now, admittedly with the Mylita crescent and the Fane crescent in the lower right-hand corner, the sex differences isn't so obvious, but it's still fairly consistent within that family. Greater fritillaries. We've got the green fritillary, Snyder's fritillary, great basin fritillary. I didn't take the time to put the gender symbols on these butterflies, but you can see the male on the left, female on the right. We can see these differences. Now, when I say greater fritillaries, um, I'm not talking long wings. So the gulf fritillary is not a true fritillary of the genus Spearia. Neither is the variegated fritillary. I'm talking about 
a very large family uh, has many species in North America, especially west of the continental divide of tons of what we call spearia or greater fritillaries. Speaking of fritillaries, there's some larger showier species where we get into a little bit more sexual dimorphism, just as an FYI, the great spangled fritillary has a dark female, which actually looks like a morning cloak on wing. Uh, same story with the Nicomus fritillary. Uh, we talked about subspecies earlier, and I just want to say that great spangled fritillary, that term is kind of vague. Uh, there are different subspecies of the great spangled fritillary. Most of you who are familiar with this butterfly are familiar with the uh, nominate subspecies, uh, wet, or excuse me, east of the continental divide, or Spearia sibley sibley. Whereas on the left here in this graphic, we have Spearia sibley latona. So those are the same species. They're all great spangled frits, but they're different subspecies. So just another plug for learning subspecies. One of the most showiest butterflies in all of North America is the Diana, just gorgeous. As a matter of fact, the Diana female that you see there also mimics the pipevine swallowtails. You know, one of the ironies of the brushfoot families is three of the species that we as breeders are the most familiar with, painted ladies, red admirals, and morning cloaks. They're the toughest ones to separate by gender based upon wing shape, especially the painted lady. If you look at the painted lady and you're looking at the wing shape of the male, the wing shape of the female, you're going, uh, I don't see much of a difference. You look at the abdomen size, not much of a difference. You do see something of a difference in the red admiral. But morning cloak males have also been known, you see the wing shape difference is similar to be fat. So for these three species, uh, I know many of you are breeding them already. If you happen to see them in the field, the way to separate males from females is behavior over wing markings. Are they patrolling? Are they perching? Are they chasing? Or are they more subtly flying around, laying low, looking to lay eggs? And I don't know how many of you, you would find this as useful, but I want to talk just a little bit about one of my favorite families, Lacinidae, or gossamer wing butterflies, which consists of hair streaks, blues, and coppers. Generally speaking, males of all three groups, of those three groups, uh, hair streaks, blues, and coppers, tend to have a more of a solid color, as you see on the left, with a narrow black border. Um, whereas females, like in the blues, the females tend to be brown, brownish with an orange uh, margin on the ventral uh, hind wing, or they tend to be blue with a much broader black border. If you look at the western tail blue on the first set of rows, third from the left, that female there has got a very large black border and very little purple. And the copper's uh, basic difference is the males, again, tend to be a solid ground color of blue or copper with a narrow black border, and the females tend to be more checkered. Okay, let's jump into part four. The last part of our presentation today is something many of you are already familiar with. So we're gonna be jumping from strategy to strategy to strategy for our different species groups of butterflies where many of you are pros at many of these species uh, using flight houses to breed them and others uh, might be new butterfly species for you. Before diving into cage and flight house setups, it's important to realize one thing about cage gravid female instincts, and that is this. If you collect a gravid female butterfly in the wild and immediately and properly set her up in a cage, and by properly, I know many of you like to put in plenty of host plant in a cage next to a light source where, there, where the host plant is draped in such a way that it's between the butterfly and the light source, she flies towards the light source and she runs into the host plant. On this photo here, I didn't do that so well, did I? I uh, got cuttings of Cianothus volutinus, snowbush Cianothus, and probably should have um, placed it higher in the setup in the cage. Um, but a problem you may run into is if you immediately set up a female to lay eggs, they may behave like these three female pale swallowtails are doing in this slide, and that is fly to the light and try to escape. So why is this? One reality that may not be generally noticeable amongst breeders and hobbyists, especially if pairings and egg production comes from a flight house, is that a gravid female's instinct to lay eggs generally takes third fiddle. It's a third priority. In other words, caged females have three instincts or three main instincts that I've been able to note over the years in this order of priority. The instinct to fly to the light, the instinct to nectar, 
and the instinct to lay eggs. Now, many of you are engaged in standard operating procedures of breeding monarchs and other species in flight houses where you have plenty of host plant, you have plenty of nectar source, and it may not be critical to monitor these three instincts because you're gonna get pairings. And from the pairings, you're gonna get females and the females are gonna nectar, the males are gonna nectar. Eventually the females are gonna lay eggs. You now have egg production, you move them to a separate location or perhaps you move the gravid females to a separate location and you follow your standard operating procedures. But if you're collecting gravid females from the field and setting up in smaller pop-up cages, then understanding these three instincts in this priority becomes relevant. So the goal is how do we take priority or instinct number three and bump it up to number two, okay? How do we take number three and make it number two? And to do that, you wanna feed them regularly. They have an instinct to nectar. They need to be hydrated. And many of you are very good at hydrating butterflies. Um, I use honey water 10 parts to one. Some species of butterflies will automatically send out their proboscis to nectar. Others need a little coaxing. And I'm sure many of you have learned which ones do that and which ones don't. But here's some photos of some local Utah butterflies setting up females to lay eggs. Um, when, before I set them up to lay eggs, I feed them regularly. So now that we uh, get the instinct to lay eggs to surpass the instinct, how do we, excuse me, let me say that again. Instinct number two, how do we get the instinct to lay eggs to surpass instinct number one? the instinct to fly to the light. And that's the tricky one that I had to learn over the years through trial and error. And the answer to this question may seem counterintuitive to many of you, even kind of bizarre. But while taking her out to feed regularly because you don't want to dehydrate, place your female in a dark closet for 24 hours, small butterflies, 48 to 72 hours, medium-sized butterflies, or 96 hours, large butterflies. So what I do is I place them in a dark closet. Yes, I feed them every day. Do not let them dehydrate. But I call this female prep time. Getting them ready to lay eggs, helping them really feel the ever increasing itch to lay eggs. And I hate to use this analogy, but all of us know what it's like when we have to use the restroom and we're delayed. And the urge grows stronger and stronger, we become desperate. It's not a whole lot different with female butterflies. Um, if you set them up in a closet and, and allow them to nectar, their itch to lay eggs will grow and grow. Eventually, when you set them up after their prep time, be it one, two, three, or four days, depending upon species as shown in the slide, you'll get much greater egg production because their instinct to lay eggs will surpass that itch to fly to the light and they'll want to lay more eggs. So um, with regards to what species and what setups, um, I created this little slide here. Um, for like the tiger swallowtail group with flight house, uh, it's not that critical how long the prep type is because they're flying in the flight house all day. They're nectaring at will, they're basking at will, they're resting at will, and then when they're ready, after they nectar, they will lay eggs uh, after they mate. For a pop-up cage for tiger swallowtails, I recommend you put tiger swallowtails in the dark for 96 hours before setting them up. It takes that long for them to get ready, at least on the average. Um, for medium-sized brushfoot butterflies, I recommend 72 hours. Um, for smaller swallowtails in a 12-inch uh, cube pop-up, I recommend 72 hours. And then I'll be talking about some of these uh, portable cage and twin cup for smaller butterflies. And it ranges between zero hours and 24 hours. For example, orange tips feed on a certain mustard which goes to flower and then to silique and then burns up in nature very fast. So whenever I catch orange tip females, there's no prep time. I set them up immediately, they lay eggs immediately because they know instinctively that the eggs need to hatch, the larvae need to uh, feed to last instar pupate before their host plants burns out and they're on the clock. So there's no prep time for orange tips, FYI. Okay, let's talk about flight houses. I by no means, I'm not a subject matter expert. Many of you use flight houses for your standard operating procedures. Um, you set it up with host plants, with nectar sources, and many of you have this figured out. The idea, you put in many males and females, all reared, and they rebreed, and then you're able to uh, get the females to lay eggs again. Uh, some of you, and I've done this in a flight house, is once I get a pairing, I do separate them out, 
uh, until they're done coupling, I put the male back in the flight house, I put the female in a, in a pop-up and set her up to lay eggs. So let's talk about different sizes of pop-up cages and how they apply to different species groups. I like to use the 24 by 24 by 36 pop-ups for the tiger swallowtail group and other larger swallowtails because they like to fly around uh, and land on the host, contrast to other brushfoot butterflies that like to land and walk around to lay their eggs. Uh, in this picture, I've got some pale swallowtails and potted host, and they're literally flying around and approaching the leaf. Um, and I was able to get a lot of eggs. Now those females were prepped for 96 hours before I set them up to lay those eggs. Otherwise they would just fly to the light and want to escape initially. So I, for, for larger swallowtails, I like to use a larger pop-up cage. Um, I can't share these videos with you right now because I've got this headset and the headset is not, I got my speakers on my computer right over there and I tried to switch gears to YouTube to show some of these videos and the audio was terrible. So here's some links um, that you can find on my YouTube channel on how to get eggs and I actually show how to set it up for pale swallowtails and western tiger swallowtails. For the genus Limonitis, for red spotted purples, Wiedemeyer's admirals, uh, viceroys, um, I use a smaller pop-up cage, a medium, 13 by 13 by 24, put in potted host. I prep the females for three days and they usually go in and if you watch this video, as you see there, they lay lots of eggs on the tips of the leaves. Let's talk about small pop-up cubes. I like placing females inside 12 inch cubes that are placed over live plants where I open the cage on the zipper side and turn it upside down and secure with rocks. In the photo on the left, I have an anise swallowtail, kind of a smaller swallowtail in the tiger swallowtail group, set up to lay eggs on parsley. And this setup would also work well for Eastern black swallowtails. You've got anise and Eastern blacks are of similar size, of similar behavior, both part of the black swallowtail group. One basically flies west of the divide, the other flies basically east of the divide, except for Arizona. But in the photo on the left, I got the anise swallowtail to lay about 100 eggs in that setup after she was prepped for three days. In the photo on the right, I'm actually using a new 12 inch pop-up that has two sets of zippers on opposite ends, making it easier to unzip one side and place over the top of host alfalfa. This is a clouded sulfur female, by the way. Whereas the opposite end has another set of zippers allowing me to open the cage and place the, you know, the females inside. So you can see in that picture on the right that it, the host, um, the pop-up cage has been opened and placed over the host alfalfa, but there's another set of zippers up on top. Another setup to obtain eggs from parsley feeding swallowtails like Eastern Blacks and Anise is to place a five gallon paint strainer on top of a three or four gallon pot of potted parsley. In this setup, I insert three dowels in a triangular orientation so as to give the paint strainer some depth and dimension. And then I put the paint strainer on top and secure it with a rope. Admittedly, this is a little awkward if the female is ready to fly when you set her up. So what I do is put the female in the refrigerator for what, five, 10 minutes and slow her down. And then when I've got the pot, I place the female on top. She's still chill, she's not ready to fly. And then I set up the dowels and set up the paint strainer and rope it in. And this also worked well for um, Eastern Blacks and Anise Swallowtails. I also have a, you can also use a, a 17 inch catch release cylinder cage. Uh, a lot of places sell these, I carry them as well. Um, what I like to do is on some of them, I actually cut out the bottom and secure the bottom with a rope and then use the top zipper to put the females in. Picture on the left is just a, a picture with butterflies, uh, Lorquins Admirals flying, but the one on the right is set up either to get eggs out of females or it's also set up for caterpillars. Caterpillar sleeves can also be productive for females of brushfoot butterflies like morning cloaks. California tortoiseshells or admirals backslash viceroys that feed on deciduous trees. Again, females of these brushfoots are content to walk around the sleeve and deposit eggs and don't necessarily need to fly around in a large bulky cage to lay their eggs. So the Wiedemeyer's admirals on the left, she walked around the aspens and deposited a lot of eggs on the tips of the aspen. Whereas on the right, the morning cloak laid eggs uh, on the willows, but not on the leaves on the stems. Those of you who raise morning cloaks know that they lay their eggs in clutches of large numbers, 100 to 150 and so forth. Okay, years before I marketed pop-up cages for my e-commerce store, I wanted to create a homemade contraption designed to specifically 
for smaller brushfoot and pired butterflies where females don't need a lot of space to fly to eggs or host cuttings. Um, using a 12 inch cube for these smaller checker spots and crescent spots and smaller sulfurs is fine. Sometimes it makes it difficult to set up all that host and, and fish out all the eggs. Um, if it's a smaller butterfly, I like these uh, portable cages. Cages. These portable cages are basically the same size as Judy Sunshine's mini pop-ups. So what they are is um, on the bottom, there's an actual reservoir. There's an inverted cup that has holes drilled into it. Um, and then there's screen also fished into that and secured with post mix and dried. Um, and then when it's ready, then I have a, a lid on top that also has screen. Um, and then I fill that, I fill the reservoir at the bottom with water, fish cuttings inside, and this little unit, this portable cage, place it next to a window, and it's everything you need to get these smaller butterflies to lay eggs. On the left, I've got some uh, desert orange tips that laid dozens and dozens of eggs on its host, Calanthus lasiophyllum. I can't, can't remember the common name. It's a mustard <laughs> down in the desert. On the right, I've got plantain, and I've got a couple of Buckeye females laying eggs on the plantain. Um, they don't seem to really need a larger cage. Smaller butterflies are content with smaller cages. This is a clouded sulfur female in a pop-up, or excuse me, in a portable cage, and she dumped out hundreds of eggs on alfalfa. Okay, just to review what species groups that I use for portable cages, I've used them for Parnassians, which is a swallowtail. Um, sulfurs, ch uh, checkered whites, orange tips, ladies, buckeyes, uh, crescent spots, checker spots, satyrs, even the great purple hair streak has dumped a lot of eggs using this portable cage. So here's a random mix of species that I've uh, used this setup. I realize that these homemade portable cages aren't commercially available, but using a mini pop-up would be an adequate substitute. What you would do is just place a baby food jar or two or similar, uh, filled with water on the bottom of the mini pop-up. Next, attached to the lid that has small drill holes where you've uh, placed host plant through those drill holes into the water in such a way that the female cannot drown. And that would be adequate to set up a smaller cage for these smaller butterflies. So portable cages and mini pop-ups work fine for medium to small butterflies, but there are still some even more options and uh, we're nearing the end of my presentation. So if you could bear with me in the next few minutes, there are still, still even more options if you want to raise tinier species, like we talked about the lacinids, the blues, coppers, and hair streaks. So what I do with them is relatively inexpensive and easy to set up. I take a squat tub, turn it upside down. When I say squat tub, a deli tub, 16 ounces that you can find in, in the produce department, not the produce department, but wherever you get deli, the deli department of a, of a grocery store and I drill some holes in it, either with a drill or even an X-Acto knife. The number of holes has to do with how many uh, sprigs of host and nectar you want to fish through those holes. And then I do that. Um, recently, I got a bunch of eggs out of Western Pygmy Blues, and so I've got various hosts. I've got go uh, Goosefoot as a host plant of the Western Pygmy Blue. I have some asters that I'm using for nectar, and I'm also using tumbleweed as a host plant. So what I do, is you look in the picture on the right, is I fish through uh, the stems, through the holes, and then place the holes on top of a 32 ounce cup of water and connect them together. Lastly, I take the holdout lid, um, place butterfly net material over the top of the apparatus, and then place the lid last to fasten, and then you have this setup that can not only um, allow the female butterflies, you set it next to a light source, and once you've done that, the female butterflies can bask, they can rest, they can nectar, and they can lay eggs. And they can do it without you having to go in there and feed the female separately because they're feeding themselves. So the twin cup setup is nice. It may not be practical for most breeders or hobbyists, but if you ever want to set up an educational exhibit and show off, you know, on some of these smaller showier species, you could do that for an educational exhibit. And using this setup recently, I got uh, the Western Pygmy Blue is one of the smallest in the world, and here's a photograph of some eggs that I got, and I didn't even have to feed the females, they fed themselves.
Okay, so that, like I said, that's just a heads up for you that uh, might want to raise smaller species. Okay, one last question before we uh, turn this over to questions that I want to ask is, um, or at least address with you is, why are some female butterflies stubborn? Why you collect a female, you feed her, she won't lay eggs. There are some reasons why individual females are stubborn and just want to go over that briefly. One, she may be unmated. I realize males are very aggressive in courting females, but if you collect an absolute pristine, gorgeous, fresh female in the wild, uh, that might be bad news. <laughs> she may not be mated. So that's always a possibility. Number two, if you collect a female that's really hammered, she may be done. She may have laid all of her eggs and may not have any more. So you always want to collect a fresh female, but if she has a little wear, that's, that's ideal. Part, uh, number three, they haven't been prepped. We've talked about that. Some species, uh, you need to prep them between uh, zero to 96 hours. And number four, a few species are notoriously stubborn, refusing to lay eggs in captivity. There are a handful of species in North America that are stubborn. I don't think they apply to most of you, but one of them is the California and Arizona sister. I've gotten eggs out of females, but usually for every 10 females I collect, one female is cooperative and nine are not. It's as if many of them know they're in captivity and they want nothing to do with laying eggs. Another one is the Yucca Giant Skipper. There are ways to raise that by finding um, tents on host plants on yucca that's been infested, but you don't want to collect a live female to get them to lay eggs. They, they just don't cooperate. So scaling this back, we've gone over an enormous amount of material. Uh, most of it may not apply to most of you because you know, you're already raising your given species of butterflies, but it, hopefully it's opening up your eyes and giving you some thoughts on some alternatives to add a few species to your repertoire. So I would say start somewhere, go anywhere. Um, and one thing that I've learned uh, over the years is that nature never stops teaching. One reason why I love learning about butterflies from the outdoors is I always learn something new and nature is just amazing. Um, and so I just wanted to share that. Thank you for your time.